Welcome everyone to What's New in MPMI, the virtual seminar series of the MPMI Journal. Um, while we are, so I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Jean Harris. I am the host and um, organizer of the What's New in MPMI seminar series, where we select papers from the journal to bring to you for a chance to interact with and engage with the authors and learn something new. Um, so while everyone's coming into the room, I'd like to invite you to just type into the chat where you're from. We are a very international community. We have lots of people joining us. So just um, type into the chat um, your name and where you're coming from, and then we'll, we'll be able to welcome you all. Um, okay, we have Karen from the Netherlands here. Who else is coming? Ben Petre from France, welcome. Ashley from uh, Fargo, North Dakota, from the Friesen Lab. Um, Oriellan, oh, it's going too fast. Poisson Dernier, ooh, sliding too fast from France. Robert West from Houston. Yvonne Makuka from Australia. That's middle of the night, I think, for you. Um, Kelly from Colombia, Paul Kovi from Colorado. Um, Xiao Xuan from China, Elena from Croatia. Dilip Shah, Lucia Vignale from Uruguay, Marion from Switzerland, Matias from Italy, Juan Jose from Mexico, Enas Elbalad from Egypt, um, Serkan Pazarlar from Denmark, Copenhagen, the UA from Switzerland. We have people from everywhere. Um, Flori Ramirez from Moscow, Idaho. Um, I'm going to have to unfortunately miss some people, but I hope you were all reading that. Franz Lee Flores from Guatemala, Minu Singar from South Dakota and um, Adam Steinbrenner from Seattle. So welcome everyone. It's exciting to see you all here. Um, for those of you who just came in, this is What's New in MPMI, the seminar series of the MPMI Journal. Um, we are an international community. So um, this is a chance for us to meet everyone um, from around the world and talk about things that interest us. So plants live all around the world, microbes live all around the world, and so does our community. I'm Jean Harris. I'm the host and organizer of this seminar series. And one reason I started this a number of years ago was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And we felt uh, a really strong need to connect. So many things have been canceled. We felt a strong need to connect with people all around the world. And also I had a real desire to um, promote inclusion, to connect our community, but also to welcome people to the community, to these really top-notch seminars, to people who might never have attended one in an international conference. And this gives everyone a chance to be in the room while we highlight um, exciting research from the MPMI Journal. And we also try to highlight early career scientists as we are doing today. Uh, Ying Peng Xie is our speaker today. And um, he wrote, um, co-authored this article with Libo Shan, who was also with us, Ping He and um, Chao Zhang, uh, part of the research group who came together to create a wonderful invited review, one of our distinguished HA floor reviews that um, MPMI has started under the editor-in-chief, um, Tim Friesen. This is an exciting and important series of reviews on um, key topics in plant microbe interactions. And one thing this does, this seminar does, is gives everyone a chance to interact directly with the authors outside the, your screen or the pages of the journal um, to have a chance to hear them talk about uh, the research and the um, ideas, the scientific ideas that really excite and motivate them and to give you a chance to ask questions. So we, we introduced ourselves in the chat and I hope that everyone will read and see all the people who are coming from all around the world to join us. Um, but when you ask questions, um, we will not have microphones on, but you will type your questions into the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the seminar, I will read them and they will be answered. So um, mostly in order. So 
Um, it's a great pleasure. I'd like to, I'm not going to give an extensive introduction to Ying um, Peng Xie, but um, just to say that he is currently doing a postdoc um, with Li Bo Shan and Peng He at the University of Michigan, as you can see from your slide, um, and recently moved here from Texas A&M and previously did their PhD in Hong Kong and undergraduate in China. So um, Ying Ping has also had a very international career path as many of us have. So welcome, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Ying Ping, to tell us about unlocking nature's defense, plant pattern recognition receptors as guardians against pathogenic threats. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris, for the introduction. So hello, everyone. So it's a great honor to share my topic with you today. Uh, I'm a postdoc uh, in the department of uh, MCDB at the University of Michigan. And uh, um, my working focus is on plant immune, innate immunity, um, particularly on the uh, immune pathways activated by the cell surface receptors. So today I will be discussing unlocking nature's defense plant partner recognition receptors as guardians against pathogen threat. So, so why should we study plant disease and immunity? So the answer is quite straightforward. Global crop losses and associated economic damage are prevalent. So each year, up to 40% of global crop uh, production is lost due to the damage uh, due to other pests and uh, uh, diseases. And at the same time, climate change makes these issues even worse, right, affecting our daily lives. So healthy plants with robust immune system are more likely to survive um, in the uh, stressful environments created by climate change. So understanding plant disease and the mechanisms by which plants defend themselves is crucial. So let's start it with some background on our understanding of plant immunity. So the concept of plant pathogen emerged in the 19th century. So building on the foundation of its inheritance and genetics, the floor proposed the groundbreaking gene for gene hepatitis in 1940s. And in the 1960s and 70s, researchers just discovered a, a, a diverse area of microbe associated products, uh, which termed uh, general elicitors which could stimulate immune response in plants, including uh, some uh, phytolexin production at the species level. So the term elicitor was proposed in 19, uh, 1984, at the same time as colonial or the first AVR gene, AVRA. So the 1990s saw a surge in our gene cloning, so further enhancing our understanding of uh, plant immune mechanisms. And in early 2000s, uh, Sosan and the colleagues unveiled um, remarkable similarity between the innate immunity in plant and animals. So this funding explained why plants recognize general elicitors and introduced the term PAMP, uh, which refers to the pathogen associated molecular patterns to uh, describe these plants, uh, uh, to, to, to describe this recognition. So uh, cooperatively, there were also the um, uh, increase in the cloning of, of PRRs. And one of the latest uh, breakthrough in plant immunity is the discovery of the uh, nucleotide binding and leucine risk repeat, uh, which referred to as the NIR resistance. And upon activation, the resistance proteins can oligomerize to form the resistance system which is a crucial component of an effect immune responses. So let's begin with the gene for gene hepatitis. So this theory was first introduced by uh, Floor in the 1940s, emerged from his study on Ross disease, and even before any genes were uh, cloned. So this theory proposed that uh, implant disease resistance uh, it is governed by specific interaction between a resistant gene in the plant and a, uh, a, a, a virulent gene in the pathogen. So this interaction known as AVR and uh, uh, 
this gene are highly specific and occurred at the level of individual cultivars and pathogen strains. So this work re revolutionized our understanding of plant pathogen interactions and ultimately led to the cloning of resistance genes. So after four decades of the uh, gene for gene hypothesis of post, the two cell membrane localized resistance proteins were identified. So in tomatoes, a transposon tagging technique reveals that the CF9 plays a key role in recognizing the AVR9 effector protein from a fungi pathogen. So the mutant plants lacking the CF9, as shown here with this arrow, exhibited a survival response to the hypersensitive uh, response, typically uh, by uh, characterized by some uh, rapid cell that's triggered by the AVR9 protein. And similarly, in rice, XA21 protein was identified as another uh, membrane local localized resistance protein. This protein can recognize bacterial pathogens such as Cytomonas, XA, uh, and, and in, in XA21 uh, transgenic rice plants, it displays significant higher level of resistance against Cytomonas infection compared to the white type plants. So identification of these two proteins introduced the concept of um, race-specific uh, resistance against plant pathogen. And initially, both CF9 and XA21 are thought to be similar uh, membrane-located uh, uh, resistant protein. However, under, after the later research classified CF9 as a receptor-like protein due to its uh, lack of kinase domain, while the X21 was identified as a receptor-like protein, uh, I'm sorry, uh, X21 was uh, identified as a receptor like kinase due to its kinase. And both of these two proteins is critical for uh, signaling with the plant immune system. And in 2000, a protein called FS2 was identified in apoptosis. So this membrane located protein can recognize a small flactin 2 unit from bacterial flagellin. Unlike our gene, FLS2, serve as a general receptor of, for recognizing pathogens. So FS2 is a leucine-rich repeat protein and contains 28 ARR repeats in its extracellular domain. So mutation in this FS2, such as the loss of function mutant FS22-17, lead to the increased susceptibility to see the MERS D3000 infection. This underscoring uh, the critical role of LS2 functions as a uh, player in plant immune defenses. So the discovery of FS2 is important because it is a key component uh, for plants' first line of defense against bacterial infection. And this mechanism enables plants to detect and mount a defense response even against uh, some unfamiliar uh, pathogens. So FLS2 was the first cloned PR in uh, plants and which recognized a general bacterial component rather than the race-specific molecules. And this discovery uh, also spurs the concept of uh, PAMP and the PMP trigger immunity, also known as PTI. So following the emergency of um, PAMP concept, numerous studies revealed strikingly similarity between the uh, molecular organization of animal and the plant immune system. Uh, and uh, uh, like animals, uh, plants have involved the ability to recognize PAMPs from uh, diverse uh, microbial organisms and absent uh, in potential host plants. So notably, researchers also got the discover, discovered plant receptor resembling mammalian tolex receptors as well as a conserved uh, MAPK signaling cascade and also the production of um, uh, antimicrobial peptides here. So what is uh, parton recognized receptors, aka PR? So PR consists of two main types of protein located on the plasma membrane. The first type is receptor-like kinase, also known as RK. Uh, this compromise uh, consists of three parts, an extracellular domain uh, for the sensor on the outside, 
and a trans membrane domain which anchored uh, it in, uh, in the cell membrane, and also a kinase domain which transmits signals inside the cell. And the second type is the receptor-like protein, RP. Uh, this protein lacks the kinase domain and cannot directly submit, uh, transmit uh, signals, but still play a key role in recognizing the uh, uh, external signals. So when a plant encounters a pathogen, it detects uh, molecules called uh, PAMP and also some uh, self derived molecules from DAMP, and I will introduce this uh, later in this talk. So um, these molecules can bind to the extracellular domain of the, uh, uh, these PRRs and the triggering plant's immune responses. So uh, collect these two types of RK and RP are known as PR. To illustrate the significance, the genome of Arabtopsis is predicted to contain over uh, 600 RKs and uh, 57 RPs, while the rice has more than 1,000 RKs and 90 RPs. And uh, the crucial role in uh, plant defense is evident. And uh, the PR can recognize different types of uh, molecules based on their extracellular domain. So, uh, for example, the RRR type uh, receptors like uh, the FLS2 receptors can detect microbial uh, proteins or peptides, and other types of receptors such as the uh, lysine motif receptor and the EGF type receptors and lectin type receptors can recognize microbial sugars. So uh, plants so, uh, could perceive both external and internal signals to regulate diverse biological process. So, uh, PRR uh, detect external signals from virus pathogens as, a, as well as molecules created by the plant itself. So to date, re uh, uh, researchers have identified over 60 uh, immune-related PRRs with no illicitors across vir uh, virus uh, plant species. So PRRs also perceive signals from, not only uh, perceive signals from bacteria, but also signals from uh, fungi and uh, mycetes and uh, some uh, self-derived molecules, the parasite plants, or even the, some herbivores. herbivores. So one of the most recent identified PRR is uh, Peru, and this uh, uh, RK can, uh, was found in potato and can recognize a PEP13 fragment from mycetes. So when we discuss receptors in plant immunity, a crucial question is, how is an extra, an extra cellular input uh, was transduct into an uh, intracellular output, right? Um, so for PRs, this process often involves dimerization with another receptor like kinase, commonly referred to as a um, co-receptor. So upon recognition elicited from uh, pathogens, the phosphorylation of these components is essential for activating the immune signaling cascades. And uh, remarkably, phosphorylation occurs very quick, typically within seconds after uh, binding to the elicitor. So one of the most well-studied PRR complex is a Flecton 2 FLS2 big one uh, system. And this image shows the crystal structure of the active domains of FLS2 one and FLS2. So basically, flecton 2 binds to uh, 14 ARRs uh, to the concave surface of FLS2. So flecton 2 uh, uh, binds the FLS2 active domain, directly interacts with the big one active domain. And the C-terminal region uh, of the FLS2 bound, uh, uh, bound flecton 2 work as the molecular glue, and it could stabilize the FLS2 big one dimerization and this process is both ligand and receptor mediated. Uh, this means uh, the, this immune complex is very precisely regulated. Right? So downstream uh, PR complex are receptor like cytoplasmic kinase, uh, IRCK here. So uh, IRCK uh, uh, predominantly contain a uh, uh, serine or threonine kinase 
uh, domain. So IRCK can be uh, classified into 17 some families with the most no notable example being uh, the big one, uh, PBS1 and the PBLs from uh, IRCK7 uh, subfamily. So among these, big one is the uh, most extensively started. Uh, so big one process a uh, methylation motif. So here, uh, it can facilitate its localization to the plasma membrane. And uh, in the absence of fledgling derived peptide FLAP22, uh, big one is associated with uh, both FLS2 and big one in an inactive state. Upon FLAP22, uh, bind to FLS2, this interaction promotes the, uh, uh, the, the association between FLS2 and big one and leading to a series of uh, phosphorylation events and uh, the activated big one can uh, further phosphorylate big one, which subsequently transphosphorylates tra the FLS2 big one complex. So this phosphorylation cascade occurs uh, rapidly within one meter of activation. And follow this phosphorylation, big one undergoes uh, mono ubiquitination mediated by the E3 ligase uh, RH A, 3A, and B, uh, resulting in its disassociation from the FLS2 big one complex. So, this disassociation is often coupled with endocytosis and then trigger downstream defense responses. So, this process typically takes place between uh, like 10 to 20 minutes after the ligand binding. I'm sorry. So downstream of RLCK, virus um, signaling pathways are activated, including those uh, involving uh, MAPKs, uh, IADPH, oxidase that produce uh, ROS signal and uh, calcium ion uh, channels. And recently, a, uh, a, a kinase known as DGK5 has been uh, identified as uh, playing a unique role in ADPH oxidation, RBOHD mediated ROS production. So uh, DGK5 is involved in the synthesis of uh, phosphatidic acid, which is known as PA. Uh, PA can activate ADPH oxidase, and particularly RBOHD. So uh, multiple elicitors to induce dynamic phosphorylation of DG DGK5 as we are both um, the uh, PAMP from uh, different pathogens and also some depth signals. And, uh, and uh, 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 when analyzed the DGK5 uh, after uh, selecting to uh, treatment with this uh, post tech gel, this gel is could efficiently separate the phosphorylate bands. So uh, after there's two distinct uh, bands of DG DGK5 are observed here. So, 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 so here we uh, designated the lower and the uh, upper uh, migration band of phosphorylated DGK5 as the uh, DGK5L and DGK5U uh, respectively. So uh, this phosphorylation was further confirmed using the uh, lambda phosphatase here. You see after the treatment of this phosphatase, both these two bands are gone, right? Uh, so why, uh, why are both uh, big one and uh, 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 what, what, uh, what? So, oh, I'm sorry here. So uh, in big one or uh, MPK4, uh, mutant plants, these plants should just disappear. So which means um, these two bands are phosphorylated from uh, DGK5 and P MPK4. Uh, although these, um, both these, uh, Kinase can phosphorylate DGK5. So the efforts actually are opposite. So big one phosphorylates DGK5 at serine uh, 506, uh, but the uh, MPK4 can phosphorylate DGK5 at serine 446. But big one phosphorylation DGK5 leads to a rapid uh, burst of PA and activation of plant immunity and encounters the uh, MPK4 phosphorylation of DGK5 subsequently suppress DGK5 activity and PA production and the resulting in uh, annotated uh, plant immunity. So this interplay between B1 
big one on the MP4 is crucial in regulating the PA uh, homeostasis and the overall uh, immune response of plants. So upon recognition uh, of uh, elicitors, so plants initiate a cascade of early immune responses, including uh, a, a cytosol influx of uh, calcium ions, a burst of the uh, RS and the uh, uh, stomatal closure to prevent um, further pathogen entry and the deposit deposition of uh, kalos at the cell wall to strengthen the physical barriers. So these initial responses are followed by the late uh, stage immune responses that enhance the uh, plant's overall defense system. Uh, but notably, some early responses occur within just seconds to minutes, such as uh, phosphorylation and uh, 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 calcium reflux rose burst, uh, while others can uh, uh, last hours to, to days, such as uh, stomata uh, 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 closure or chelous deposition, or even uh, the growth inhibition. And some of the responses are transient, uh, while some others are long lasting. For example, the acetylene. The acetylene production, which can uh, last for one day, and in cars to this, the calcium influx typically just uh, last for half an hour. So, um, pathogen uh, infection for the uh, 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 infection of the plant and uh, cause the perception of uh, PAMPs by PR trigger PTI, right? So, uh, this will uh, further lead to the transcription of some uh, phytokin uh, genes. So these phytokines undergoes um, maturation through clearly a cleavage or post-translational modifications and then secreted into the apoplasm. So these phytokines are also known as the uh, okay, uh, danger-associated molecular patterns. So these patterns are uh, plant-derived uh, small uh, secreted peptides with immune modulatory uh, functions, and this peptide functionally analogs to the cytokines in animals. So upon recognition of PR, uh, phytocytokine can induce danger triggered immunity, which also known as DTI. So similar to cytokines in mam mammals, uh, the phytocytokines may uh, act uh, in uh, autocrine or, or paracrine or and uh, endocrine manners to activate or moderate immune uh, responses. So the discovery of phytocytokines began with isolation of the systemic peptide from tomato leaves in uh, 1991. So uh, systemine is a 18-amino uh, uh, acid plant peptide. Hormone plays a, a crucial role in uh, wood response. Uh, this peptide was identified in the sol uh, Solanaceae uh, family. So systemine induced the production of protease inhibitors, which serve as a uh, defense against insect herbivores. So the receptor for uh, systemine named SYR1 uh, was identified in 2018. And in, uh, 2000 and, uh, in, in 2006, another endogenous peptide signal known as PEP1 was discovered in the Topsis plants. So this uh, 23 amino acid polypeptides could activate innate immune response. And the subsequent research also revealed the uh, PEPR1 is, uh, is a receptor. And today I will introduce you uh, to two representative phytochemistines. So the first one is called SCOOP. So this peptide contains an uh, SXS signature motif that is essential for its function, enable its recognition and uh, binding to its receptor Me2. Uh, just like uh, PEPs in PTI, the scoops can also trigger various uh, uh, responses in plant immune response, uh, such as uh, MPK activation, I showed here. Uh, what's really interesting is the Scoop-like sequence are also found in a wide range of uh, pathogens, including the uh, uh, fungal species such as Fazerum. In Fazerum, the scoop-like peptides is located at the end terminal of, uh, just as shown here, 
uh, of a highly conserved protein with unknown function. However, just like plant derived through the response in plant, uh, uh, the full blood peptide can also activate the MPK pathways. And uh, uh, notably here, um, why group like peptides are widely distributed in uh, fungi and uh, bacteria species? The plant groups are exclusively found in brassica plants, such as Arbitopsis. So this suggests that the plant groups may have evolved uh, later than their uh, microbial uh, counterparts. So therefore, the plant groups uh, may be convergently involved to mimic uh, microbial scoop like peptide and thus amplifying the scoop like trigger immunity. And the second phytocytokine I want to share with you is the school, uh, school peptide family. So school uh, contains an uh, N terminal signal peptide domain, a uh, variable uh, region, and also a C terminal cancer domain with two cancer cysteine residues. So the expression of these screw peptides uh, is induced upon the perception of PAMPs such as FLAP22, and the screws function as immune uh, modulatory uh, phytocytokines and significantly contribute to plant resistance against virus pathogens. So the screw receptor, which named NOT, is essential for screw induced immune response. And the big one, again, uh, serve as the co-receptor here to regulate the downstream immune responses. And uh, a, a unique feature of the uh, screw peptide here uh, uh, is its ability to suppress FLAP22 uh, FLAP and uh, uh, abscisic acid induced stomata uh, closure. Because we know upon uh, sensing uh, initial infections, plants could respond to PAMPs and the phytocytokines. Uh, leading to the rapid stomata uh, closing to restrict pathogen entry. Uh, this process was known as the uh, uh, stomata uh, immunity. And in responses, plants, uh, uh, pathogens have involved the uh, counter, uh, have involved uh, counter defense strategies, such as releasing some uh, 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 toxins. Uh, uh, or effectors to keep stomata open and facilitate the, 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 the injury. And the, moreover, uh, PAP induced stomata uh, uh, closure cre creates a water rate of apoplast that promote the bacteria uh, multiplication uh, uh, and the prolonged uh, stomata closure can also reduce uh, transmission uh, rates and negatively impact plant productivity. So to counteract the to counteract this uh, effects, the plants could induce uh, specific phytocytokines such as screws to reopen the stomata, and this mechanism is termed uh, apoplastic immunity. And this immunity can help reduce the water uh, potentials and by disrupting the uh, pathogen favorable uh, water rate environment necessary for uh, pathogen. Uh, growth and uh, lesion development. So as previously uh, mentioned, the co-receptor big one is a, a crucial, uh, critical uh, component of the uh, PR complex as many PR interact with uh, big one to transduce signal into the cell. So apoptosis big one uh, is uh, part of the CERC family, which comprises five members here from one to five. So PRR could recruit big one and sec four to trigger a cascade of uh, defense response upon detecting the pumps from uh, bacteria, omycid, uh, fungi, and dam peptides. However, big one is also an ideal target for the pathogens to attack, right? And uh, indeed, uh, many bacteria effectors, including uh, uh, AVRPTO, AVRPTOB, and HOP F2 and HOP B1 have been reported to disrupt big one's function here. So by this strategy can effectively, uh, it, uh, could efficiently uh, interfere with the multiple PRR signal pathway, right? So this strategy of targeting beta one to simultaneously impair virus 
uh, immune response is referred to in Chinese as key tubers with one dose. And in 2007, two studies uh, reported that the deletion of BIC1 and SIG4 uh, could lead to uh, cell death in apoptosis. And this type of cell death is independent of the uh, browsing nose thread and can result in necro necrosis uh, spores on leaves. And these observations suggest a dual function for the big ones of fourth memory. So on one hand, it can activate uh, PTI. And on the other hand, it likely suppresses some certain forms of uh, backup immunities. So big one, when, when big one loses its integrity, the backup immunity function just works like a building standby generator, right? And the uh, activating pharmacentery uh, immune responses. So this also raises the question, where does the backup immunity come from? And to investigate this, our lab ut utilized an efficient virus uh, induced gene silencing tools uh, known as VIGS here. This is a system is used to create transient RNA interference in apoptosis. So the RNA targeting BIC1 and SIG4 uh, uh, a phenol, phenol copied the BIC1 SIG4 dumb mutant, exhibiting a, a status phenotype. So using this powerful tool, we can screen a sequence tagged mutant library and identify several back to life mutants, such as the uh, BTL protein, uh, which involved in a uh, protein and glycolization, uh, and the BTL1 protein. Uh, was found to uh, work as a uh, cyclic nucleotide gated channel, and the BTL2 function as a, a, a as a leucine rich repeat uh, RK, and notably BTL2 can compensate for compromised PTI by activating a phytocytokine mediated backup immunity. So, how does BTL2 work? Uh, I shared a model with you here. So this image illustrated. Uh, BTL2 can collaborate with uh, SYNG20 to mediate backup immunity when BIG1 is disrupted. Um, um, uh, as I showed here, uh, the, uh, in, 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 in normal condition, BIG1 can uh, work as the co-receptor of PTI, uh, PTI and uh, suppress the backup immunity uh, caused by uh, BTL2 and the SYNG20. However, uh, when big one uh, uh, is uh, perturbed, the phosphorylation of BTL2 uh, by, by big one uh, is gone. So this was resulting in BTL2 activation, and this in turn could lead to the phosphorylation and the activation of CNG20 and 19, and this will uh, cause activation of robust backup immunity and finally even cause that death. So for a long time, plant immunity was uh, considered as a two-tier system, right? And when PR located on the uh, cell membrane trigger PTI and the, uh, the, the intracellular NLR mediated effector triggered uh, immunity, also known as ETI. So PTI and ETI share several overlapping downstream outputs, including the uh, RS production and the cathode uh, IO uh, influx and the MAPK activation. And the transcriptional programming is also changed. Uh, it is also the convergent uh, point. So recently, substantial advancement have been made in under understanding how PTI and ETI interact to create a robust uh, immune response. For example, the ROS is produced in both PTI and ETI. Actually. Uh, PTI could typically trigger a rapid and uh, a transient ROS person. But PTI and ETI together can induce a uh, biphasic uh, ROSE response. Uh, 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 this uh, is a pattern with uh, a second stronger and more sustained burst. So this uh, integrated perspective represents the plant immune system as a network with two mutually dependent uh, components. So on one hand, the ETI can uh, enhance the PTI response, for instance, upregulating the PTI components such as 
uh, RBOHD, uh, while the PTI can also uh, uh, can upregulate the uh, expression of some uh, NIR genes. So uh, to sum up, when a uh, pathog pathogen invades, the PTI can act here. Uh, can be acts as the primary defense mechanism against the infection. So while the ETI is activated through the recognition of uh, uh, pathogen uh, effectors, and the big one serves as a uh, essential code receptor for multiple PRR that initiate PTI. And uh, the pathogen-induced PTI can uh, stimulate the production of uh, DAPs and the phytocytokines, which further uh, uh, illicit uh, DTI. And the DTI has the potential to amplify PTI and activate ETI. So this established robust protection against uh, pathogen infections. However, the, the, the over activation of ETI can lead to autoimmunity. So BIC1 also play a crucial role in keep uh, some uh, components like BTR2 inactivated, and otherwise BTR2 may uh, overactivate the DTI and the ETI trigger uh, uh, overactivated uh, immunity. So uh, big one here uh, process dual role in activating PTI while also uh, restraining DTI and ETI. And the BTR2 mediated DTI could compose, uh, com com compensate for disruptive PTI when big one is uh, targeted by pathogens. Uh, however, in this uh, uh, area, there are many uh, questions are waiting to be solved. Uh, uh, I listed several uh, uh, future perspectives here. So first one is identifications of some new PRs and ligands, uh, such as uh, how many RKs and RP could serve as sensors for pathogen or dangerous threats, and the cow PR coordinate different PR and DTI signaling. And the second, uh, uh, Question is the uh, initiation and the uh, dissemination of DTI about how the uh, phytosatokines are processed for maturation and translocation, and also um, how does this uh, uh, phytosatokines function, uh, whether they are functioning in autocrines, or uh, paracrines, and endocrine signaling, and also the role of PR in uh, PTI and ETI integration are also way to be solved. Like uh, how do PR and the signaling regulate PTI ETI potentiation, and uh, whether PT uh, whether uh, PRs can act antagonistically in PTI ETI interplay. And finally, it's still uh, uh, not very clear about the specificity in PR mediated uh, signaling. So whether there is any kinds of uh, signaling specificity specificity of different PR as a single cell resolution, and how does the shared co receptors uh, maintain the signal uh, specificity. All these kind of uh, questions are waiting uh, for contributions in this area. And finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the many researchers and authors whose important and insightful work is not discussed here due to time limitations. And the, the, their contributions have been uh, invaluable uh, for shaping this field. And I also uh, would like to thank my lab members for the invaluable assistance and guidance to preparing this talk. And my supervisors, uh, Dr. Pinghi and Dr. Li Boshan, has also uh, had also been a tremendous support and engaging with me on the progress of this uh, research area. And I'm also uh, grateful to the University of Michigan for providing us a, a fantastic environment to conduct our research. Uh, I also like to extend my thanks to uh, Dr. Harris, Karen, and everyone at MPMI for organizing this uh, virtual seminar and providing me this opportunity to be here and share these topics with all of you. Thank you all for your support. Thank you, Yingping, for an excellent Thank seminar. You. That was um, really interesting, brought up lots of great ideas, um, so many directions from here. I can see lots of, of people virtually clapping for you. So that Thank definitely reflects um, how I think we're all feeling. Um, if people want to ask questions, please type them in the Q&A box on the bottom. That's where I'll be reading the questions from. 
So we'll get started there. I was, one of the things I, I loved that you brought up, I just want to highlight this before we move on to the questions is, is in your final questions, you were talking about this importance of single cell resolution. Are they acting in that cell? What about the next cell? You know, how is the signaling work? Um, we think about it often at a single cell level, but of course the plant is made up of many cells and many tissue layers. And, and um, it's just, uh, I think a really exciting and interesting direction. Okay. First question is, um, from Ryan Ketsons, which components of PTI do you think have the greatest potential for editing and engineering to enhance and increase the spectrum spectrum of disease resistance? Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, 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 question to, uh, I mean, further apply our research on the uh, uh, daily and the uh, early culture productive, right? And uh, uh, in my point of view, the most, uh, greatest potential for editing or engineer uh, here in PTI is some uh, common components in this system, right? Uh, just as I uh, mentioned, like some co-receptors, like big one, or also some uh, kinds of IRCKs that are shared components of this uh, for many kinds of, of pathways from PTI. Uh, so uh, maybe in the future, uh, we can uh, edit this uh, component to make it a little bit more uh, high efficiency to V or trigger the mo more robust immune response. And I think this will uh, enhance and increase the uh, spectrum of the resistance. And not only in one kind of uh, uh, crops, but have a more uh, broad spectrum for uh, many kinds of crops. Yeah. Very interesting uh, question. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think maybe some people type questions into the chat. So just a reminder to type them into the Q&A and we'll read them. Um, one thing that I also um, often wonder is thinking about this question when we think about the microbiome as being very complex or thinking about this as much more nuanced than it used to be um, when they were good guys and bad guys only. And um, we now know that, that interactions with microbes are important yeah. in the life of the plant, not just in terms of killing them or, or sucking out their sugar. And so yeah. um, how, you know, this, this is so interesting when we think about, since I'm coming from a symbiosis angle, um, it's intriguing because the plant is manipulate, manipulating and using these to allow entry or interactions with some microbes, but not others. So, um, Given that yeah. last question about target for engineering, what do you think about it within the context of potential beneficial interactions? Yeah, that's a very brilliant question. So uh, actually, in the uh, when I first joined this field, I also have the same question, right? So how the PR can uh, differentiate the, the single unit from uh, uh, bad or good uh, uh, bacteria, such as the uh, FLS2, right, is very, uh, specific to binding the black 22 uh, uh, peptide. However, many kind of uh, bacteria can have the flagella and then have this black 22 uh, peptide here. So uh, uh, I think uh, to answer this question, a recent uh, publication already answered this very well. Uh, this is from, uh, 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 Jeff, I think from uh, Jeff Dangos uh, group. And uh, it told us actually, uh, this, we, we, we would better to answer this question from the perspective of uh, uh, revolution. Actually, uh, evolution. Actually, uh, for this, uh, what we call the good uh, bacteria, they already evolved its own, uh, uh, like the flap 22 unit cannot be recognized by this substantial PR. This is magic, right? Some, the, 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 the bad pathogen can still keep this kind of PR and uh, Plants PR uh, can, can, can keep can, plant PR can recognize uh, these uh, uh, patterns from the bad uh, uh, pathogen, but not the good pathogens, and this will benefit the uh, plant. Uh, like just as you say, take some benefits from the good uh, pathogens, but keep these uh, 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 bad pathogens away from itself. Yeah, this is a very uh, interesting topic.
Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Harris, I think you just muted yourself. I did, oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, we now have a, another question from the audience. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. JL Tan, uh, who asks, how do you think the signaling would work in a combination of invasion and plants? For example, in the case where the insect vector brings a virus. Oh, uh, yes, because some plant virus is noted to have some mutualistic interaction with the vector. And I think if we can understand that, we can help reduce plant virus in agricultural crops. It's definitely a very nuanced question. So this idea where some plant viruses do have a benefit, some promote things like thermotolerance. Um, so, um, but on the other hand, not always good. So that's a complicated question. Yeah, I think so. This is a complicated question because actually, uh, about the virus infection in plants, uh, we, I think not many uh, researchers focus on the PR and uh, plays a role in this recognition of virus uh, patterns here. Uh, so, uh, but uh, about the uh, the signaling uh, working a combination of the invasion in plants, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, just, just like the uh, plant, uh, yeah, indeed, it can face all, many kinds of uh, stress at the same time, right? Not only from the abiotic, but also the biotic stress. But one interesting thing is, uh, it like, looks like many kind of these uh, uh, stimulators can cause a common downstream cascade. And, uh, but a, a, a more interesting uh, question, but not unsolved is, uh, it seems like some certain uh, illustrators can cause a certain, uh, I mean, the unique pattern of uh, plants employed to, uh, to, to, to fade off the uh, uh, pathogen infection, such as the, the screw pepper, as I just uh, uh, presented, it can reopen the stomata and uh, let the uh, water evaporate it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I think this could be a good example for answer the question uh, whether the insect, uh, uh, the, the insect, uh, the, uh, together with the, the the virus here. I mean, uh, although this, uh, I mean, this could be a possible that uh, although the insect and the virus can, uh, infect the plant at the same time, but the common downstream cascade, I mean, the major, uh downstream uh, signaling is similar. But some certain species of insect or virus can also cause some uh, specific uh, uh, responses just as the screw did. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is a very open uh, question. We need to definitely much more efforts to answer this question. Yeah. Yes, it's, yeah, that's definitely a, a complicated one. We're moving yeah. on now to um, Aman Jayakar, who is curious about what is known about the role of PPRR in phytoplasma infection. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, the, the question you want to know the role of PRR, right? PR and the, the uh, phytoplasma infection. Um, let me see. Uh, um, I think the, uh, the, the PR uh, is uh, regarded as the uh, first first uh, first first line of the uh, plants to recognize the infection of uh, 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 different pathogens. Um, um, Phytoplasma is um, very tricky, isn't it? The way it is. Yeah, yeah, it's very tricky. I mean. Uh, people don't have uh, much uh, uh, study about these this, this, this pathogens. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, topic, and uh, I think uh, people here, uh, people today, uh, generally use some uh, uh, crops or uh, autopsies as a model plants to study the uh, uh, function of PR in uh, plant innate immunity, and. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, 
This yeah, no, there's some interesting research now. going on in phytoplasma, but there's still is so much unknown that um, yeah, these connections so unknown, yeah. are being drawn. Yeah, it's an interesting area of research. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some, you know, some PR are conserved and limited to some certain species. Um, although sometimes you cannot find a PR in apoptosis, but it doesn't mean you cannot find it in other uh, plant species. Uh, could be this PR, or some PRs also functions in some certain uh, plants on the, uh, some, or even some certain uh, pathogen species. Yeah, but you mm -hmm. just need to work it out to find a way to uh, recognize it. And yes, yeah. this is uh, definitely one of the future perspective we need to explore more. So um, another um, audience member asks, why do, does overexpression of some PRRs cause cell death when expressed transiently? Is it considered a hypersensitive response or a PTI response? I would say, uh, actually, uh, when we talk about the cell death, we generally uh, thought it's a contribution from the downstream ETI rather than PTI. Because PTI is uh, induced very quick, but relatively a little bit uh, much weaker than the ETI. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, so, like like some PR, indeed we found uh, the data reports for reports some of PR or, or even perceiving some elicitor can directly uh, activate ETI, uh, can directly uh, induce the uh, uh, status caused by hypersensitive responses. And the, but the, the mechanism is still, uh, 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 unknown now. So yeah, this is uh, also a uh, interesting topic for future to explore. But uh, yes, you know, and, and it's this is definitely a, a hypersensitive response, but not a yeah. Know. And it's it's so interesting because when I first started learning about this, we had these very distinct buckets that we put things in. Is it this or this? And they were different. And I think now with what you were talking about with this much more integrated view of ETI and PTI as, as just a network of signaling, some of which are re recognizing things outside the cell and some inside the cell, kind of brings that back to the fact that these are not as distinct as all parts of this same network. Yeah. Okay, one more um, says, thank you for this lovely talk. I was wondering if plants are able to differentiate between pathogen-induced damage and mechanical or physical damage when sensing damps. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that is a, 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 a good question. So um, uh, uh, to, to directly answer your question, so if the plant are able to uh, differentiate between the PAMs and them. Uh, I would say uh, the, 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 the extracellular domain of certain PR already did this work, right? But the note, what the note, note, uh, uh, note, note for here is the uh, PAMs and DAMs uh, in the current understanding uh, may occur in different time point, right? Uh, the, the current um, concept introduced that uh, DAMs could be introduced by the recognition of some paths like flav 22 uh, It can uh, uh, just take the example I just uh, presented here, like uh, a screw, and it, the expression and the uh, maturation of some uh, phytosatokines can be induced uh, by PAMP, uh, by, 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 by PAMP, yes. So uh, I would say um, there are many kinds of way uh, for plants to differentiate uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, Camp and them are uh, both in different time point and by different receptors. Yeah, this is a smart point of this uh, plant immunity. Yeah, and this is a, a, a theme that you brought up before when asking the question, you know, if yeah. all these different specific receptors use back one, where do you get your specificity or do you need the specificity? And yeah, yeah. It's a similar kind of question. Um, okay, another um, attendee asks, what do you think about um, the trade-off between resistance and growth? And what kind of resistance would be durable, right? Because you don't want to lose, right? If your whole goal is crop yields, you don't want to lose too much growth. On the other hand, right, you need some resistance. So what kind of resistance would be durable? Yeah, 
uh, I think this is a meaningful uh, question. And uh, uh, in my point of view, the plant facing the uh, the very challenging uh, environment, not only from the abiotic stress and also biotic stress, right? So in this case, the plant have to uh, respond to certain uh, uh, stimulus very quick. Uh, so that means if plant use the energy to be defense of the uh, invasion of pathogens, it must be affect, uh, 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 in most cases, the negatively uh, affects growth of plants. So, uh, uh, and uh, I think the resistance, uh, for, for the resistance of our plant, uh, it's better to have a way uh, to just slightly activate the downstream uh, robust uh, uh, immune response such as uh, ETI, but find a way just find, find the trade-off trade point, I mean the balance point, to just slightly activate the, acti uh, the immune uh, immune response of the plant, but not uh, too robust to cause any uh, growth defect. Otherwise, it will affect the yield of the crops, right? So yeah, this is, uh, I think this is a future application uh, direction of this uh, 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 for, for understanding of plant immunity. Yeah. Oh, don't hurry. No. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm back. Um, but I, I was I was just agreeing with and you ours. on that one. It's definitely a, a, a direction. So our next question is from Iris Molhoff, who asks, how does BAC1 find all of these different PRRs in the membrane? Is there just an excess of BAC1 in the plasma membrane? Does every PRR just have a BAC1 nearby at all times? Yeah, that is quite a detailed question. Yeah. Uh, what I didn't mention here, actually, uh, if you notice, say, like many uh, family members from this uh, third family had that they are uh, LRRK, but they have very short LRR domain. Like in big one, it can only uh, contain, I remember, five LRR domain, right? But if you compare with some specific PR like Flex 22, it ha has uh, 28 LRR domains, super long domain. External domain, right? So I think this is the reason why big one can find so many different PR because it's very short. So it can more be it can be more easier to find with other PR because it has a simple structure, right? So uh, your next question is, uh, are, are they uh, are they co-located yeah. within the membrane? At the all time. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh it's not necessary to uh for PR have always have big one nearby, and also not not all PR uh uh need the corresponding of big one, right? Uh, but I what I can tell you is the interaction between PR and big one is very very strong. So I think um yeah in the uh in the normal condition. Uh, 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 many uh, PR could have the uh, big one uh, interacted together. But the key uh, factor here interacts the activation of this complex is the binding of elicitor and uh, the downstream phosphorylation of this PR on the big one, right? So you can just imagine uh, these two proteins just get together, but it's always done by, once it can perceive some uh, out uh, some some elicitors, it can quick phosphorylate it and activate downstream uh, like RSCK and cause uh, plant immunity. Yeah, this is a clever strategy. Yes, there's um, this also reminds me of um, like non factor signaling and symbiosis, where there's also a co receptor, this two halves of receptor, co receptor, and um, they are associated with certain micro domains in the plasma membrane, right? So, remorins. Um, flotillins, and there's this sense of a microdomain, which may reorganize some of the components of a signaling complex. So when it binds, it's ready to go. So there may be other, um, you know, it, it's possible that that some of these are floating around in the membrane and just waiting, and it's possible that others are be organized, maybe in response to prior life history or um, 
maybe just something about the kind of plant. So you may even get a mixture of that, of some that are um, kind of waiting with the other components nearby to, to signal, or some that, that just have to find them. Maybe that's some of the timing of some of these different responses. So our next question is um, from Aurelien Boisson Dernier, who asks, which one came first, plant peptides to regulate immunity or pathogen peptides to manipulate plant physiology? This is a chicken or the egg question. And um, are they examples of horizontal gene transfer or is it mostly convergent evolution? It's a very good question. Yeah, very good. This is a very good question. Like, uh, like, just like, like in the example I just listed to your scoop, this case it, it looks like the 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 the, uh, the plant involved like slower than the pathogens, right? But I, what I can tell you is, uh, there are also other kinds of peptide, uh, in plant, uh, uh but also from the signature in pathogens like the rough peptide, right? But in their case, this seems like the 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 plant involved uh, quicker. Than the uh uh than, than the uh, pathogens did. So for answer your question, I would like to say both, both the horizontal gene transfer and the uh, convergent evolution uh happened here in the interaction between pathogens and uh and uh, and, and the plant uh, receptor, but case by case. And uh, for specifics, we we need to do more research on the evolution uh, personal view to see whether. Uh, what 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 really happened there? Yeah, this is a very brilliant question. Yeah. Okay, we're only going to answer two more questions and then we'll finish. Um, lots of great, great discussion here. Um, our next one is from Chandan Moria, who asks: You mentioned the role of BAC1 as a co-receptor in various immune responses. How does BAC1 specifically contribute to immunity against root-related pathogens? and what challenges exist in studying back one mediated defense in root tissue compared to above ground plant parts. Oh, that's always the tricky part about roots, right? They're, they're below ground in the soil, um, but they can be studied. Uh, so, but that's a good question. How does back one- um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. To this immunity? Is yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as I done said, yeah, uh, this, this is the worst of uh, magic part, right? Like, like some PAP, uh, like PEP1, uh, like, like some damp like uh, phytosatokins such as PEP1 or um, uh, scoops, they also have the relies on the code receptor big one uh, to cause downstream responses, right? But these two peptides, PEP1 and the scoop, they have very significant uh, uh, effects on the inhibition of root growth, right? But if you compare with other uh, elicitor like flutein 2 although it can affect, but it's not uh, very significant. Yeah, this is also a tricky part. I think this is also the challenge uh, point here. So how can we uh, tell uh, where that did this uh, uh, specificity of the co-receptor came from, right? What's, all these kind of uh, PR all go through this uh, convergent point, but it finally gives rise to totally different responses. Yeah, right. And uh, uh, your question too is, um, what oh, challenge, challenges challenge exist in root tissue compared to the above ground plant parts? <laughs> I would say, uh, uh, I didn't do much. Uh, I, I didn't do much uh, research on the root tissues. Uh, but the, the challenge, uh, challenge, if uh, from uh, technically uh, speaking, challenge would be. A root tissues you need to do quite a lot of microscope work, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, uh, time, very, very time consuming and uh, uh, maybe not uh, very easy like we people did the uh, uh, immunity uh, on the uh, above ground plant parts. Um, yeah, yeah, but I think uh, it's uh, it's if if it's necessary like for some. Uh, uh, elicitors, you already can see the significant uh, change in uh, root parts. It'd be worthwhile to e explore uh, what happened there. Yeah, and I know people 
uh, already developed quite some uh, uh, cutting edge uh, technologies to study the root, I mean, the, to observe the growth of a root, the direction and different time point to observe the root with different types of uh, 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 elicitors such as the, the RUARF. Uh, yeah, this would be a uh, yeah, very good uh, point to explore in the future. Yeah, so um, we are going to have one more question, but I just want to remind people that they can go get more detail out of this by reading the article in the MPMI journal. It's connected, um, it's linked to where you did your registration and um, we will post it in the chat. Um, I think it was posted earlier, but ah, here we have it posted in the chat. So you can link to that. And remember that there is a person to contact with email questions for every article. Sometimes there's two. And um, that's a great way to continue this conversation. And I'm sure Yingping would also be interested in discussing this um, with people either by email or um, at some next conference. And also wanted to remind people that this HH4 review um, is an exciting series of reviews covering key topics in plant microbe interactions. And this is the first one we've highlighted in what's new in MPMI. But if you go to the MPMI journal website, you'll be able to find the list of other reviews. And if you enjoyed this, you may really find the others to be useful and interesting. Um, now we're going to move on to our last question by uh, Laurence um, Binchetler. Are the PRR in microdomains graft-like detergent insoluble membranes? This was kind of what we were hinting at before. So, so what's the organization within the plasma membrane? What's known? Yes, uh, my answer is yes. The PRR, uh, indeed, uh, you can find it in the uh, uh, micro domain of the cell membrane and it also uh, floating on the cell membrane like the raft. So what happened here in my, uh, in my mind, uh, if you uh, if you uh, if you have uh, some experience in uh, observing the microscope like turf, you can see the surface of your uh, PRs of, on the on the on the cell membrane. So you can see many many dots, just uh, maybe evenly or unevenly distributed across the whole cell membrane. So, but the cool thing is this this point. I mean, this point represents to the individual uh, PR molecules. They are dynamic. They're not, not completely steady there. They keep moving very fast, or sometimes it can even gathering together and uh, uh, to a certain part and undergoes endocytosis to exert the downstream signal. Yeah. This is about the dynamic of these behaviors of PR on the center. Yes, interesting. So many different areas to go from here. So um, thanks everybody for your participation. Thanks especially to Yingping um, Chie for this wonderful seminar. Oh, Remember this will be, thank you. This will be recorded or was recorded. And so it will be posted hopefully in uh, about a day or so. If anybody would like to help edit the transcript, um, that would be terrific because that helps us to make it more accessible. If you're interested in participating in this way, please e contact me um, by email and I would be happy to work with you on that. So um, thanks again, Ying Peng. And thank you, I, thank you, Dr. Harry. Uh, thank welcome. you, everyone. Thanks everyone for your participation. Great discussion. And there are a couple of nice notes in the chat about um, how much people enjoyed the seminar. Okay, thanks everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Till next time. Bye.